Happy Monday. Today, we are back with part three, talking about the importance of stomach acid. Today, we're talking about common symptoms, the causes of low stomach acid, and ways that you can start to naturally support your stomach acid levels, as this is vital to your digestive system and your ability to absorb vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and maintain optimal balance in the body. You hear all the bull about diet and exercise. Carbs are evil. Do more cardio. Never eat bread or cookies again. Just do a juice cleanse. We get it. We fell for all of the BS too. It's time to go right to the source with the truth about how to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. I am Liz. And I'm Becca. We are your nutrition educators and this is The Food Code. Welcome back to The Food Code. Yes, part three. So we've gotten some feedback on our stomach acid podcasts Mm -hmm. and people like them. Here's the the tough thing. This stuff gets a little science-y. And so Liz and I were actually talking about it prior to podcasting this morning that like we're going to do our best to stay authentic to ourselves while also integrating research and science-y language and Mm -hmm. physiology of the body because we got it. You know, it's just... It's also the direction we're heading in. You know, right. we used to be a little bit, a little bit more lifestyle based. Um, and now, I mean, based off of our population and the people that we help, we, we had to go into this. There were too many people that we were doing the right things. They were doing the right things, quote unquote, the right things, eating enough, you know, focusing on sleep, focusing on stress and just not seeing any improvement. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you go down the rabbit holes of like, how do you, how do you help your clients best? And we really became passionate and excited about this, you know, this avenue. Um, and so we are going to be a little bit more sciencey, but we're going to do better. We're going to do better with making it because we want it to be interesting to listen to mm-hmm. and not dry. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I was talking with a client who got a copy of the book, you know, why stomach acid is good for you. And she's like, you know, it's dry. It's a little bit hard to listen to at some points in time. I totally get that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, the reason why we're bringing this to you as our listeners is because this is one of the foundational things that we see is a root cause issue for many, many clients, for a lot of people. And so while it's not sexy and while it's not entertaining, it's very, very important. And so this is a health podcast. This is a nutrition uh, education podcast. And so again, we'll try to make it a little bit more lighthearted and fun for you. Um, but sometimes there's going to be some sciencey things that we mm-hmm. have to bring in because, you know, like we've gotten some questions that we've even pulled together for a and a coming up. There are things either out of scope or that do require research uh, to speak on. Like one of the questions uh, that we're going to answer in an upcoming episode is how much protein do kids need? And there's not a lot of information mm. out there. It's a very, uh, you know, touchy subject. And so I, I did find some good research articles and we're going to pull from that because I'm not yeah. going to advise you on what you should no. be. And you got to think that this is the hardest part about pregnancy. So I have a couple clients that are pregnant and I have, you know, we have both have children. You cannot like ethically test on children Mm -hmm. and on pregnant women. It's just not, it's not right. Um, They can't be like consenting adults, you know, like, so I actually saw really not off topic, but speaking of children, I saw a picture Dr. Huberman posted um, of, I think it was maybe like the forties and they were called baby cages. Sounds really bad, right? But what they were, where they were cages that would hang off the side of apartment buildings that babies could go in to get more vitamin D because they knew how important it was for babies to get enough vitamin D. But if you live in an apartment, it's not as easy to go outside in like a lawn or a yard safely. And so literally the picture, I got to find it. The picture is of a baby in an iron steel cage hanging off the side of a, it's like extended beyond the side of the apartment building. Like, yes, not safe, but also like, Yep. Not, not, not incorrect. Well, I remember, so my oldest sister, she lives in Copenhagen, Denmark, and she has four kids. She's a nurse and they lived in an apartment building for the first two kids. I remember distinctly going, it would be me and my dad and my mom, and we would stay at this <laughs> apartment with them and their two kids. It was like so crammed, but she would, she would put her kids in the bassinet. They slept outside. It didn't matter, you know, colds or obviously she wasn't going to do it in a blizzard, but they always slept outside and they were always exposed uh, to the sun in the warmer climates. So, and, um, you know, I believe that's also uh, pretty normal in mm-hmm. other countries. Uh, we would also uh, leave when we would go to the shopping mall or we would go out for lunch. 
she would leave the baby in the baby carrier outside. I mean, we could see it from the inside window. Uh, and then there was someone who actually came and I'm sure you guys remember this is probably, so let's see, Sophie is in her twenties, probably 10 or 15 years ago. Now there was a lady that was in New York and did this very same thing that is normal in her culture. And they arrested her. Oh my gosh. Because it's not normal here. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. So. I mean, it'd probably be seen as like child abuse. Right. But I mean, I leave Carson outside our house all the time. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I have to manage Taylor inside. <laughs> One of our neighbors was over yesterday and um, Marcus loves her daughter. And she was asking me, does he play outside in the yard by himself? And I said, well, no, uh, we, I always want to have eyes on him because we don't have a, a fence. You guys have a fence at least no, in the he's backyard. He's in the front yard for yeah. sure. And I'll walk out sometimes and I'll be like, Carson. Carson mm -hmm. and I like have to like call for him a couple times because our neighbors have a swing set so like yeah. sometimes he'll walk around the side and go on the swing set but I mean he's four you know old enough technically I try to go out every like three to five minutes our, we are very fortunate too our street is very like low traffic mm -hmm. so there aren't a lot of cars on yeah. the street but either way great parenting you know if you want uh if you want more parenting advice just come to me <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right. So we're going to dive into it today. We're going to give you a quick recap of uh, episode one and two. We've been talking about the importance of stomach acid. We have been talking about, you know, what roles it plays in the body. And so I just want to give you a quick recap of symptoms that can indicate that you have a deficiency in stomach acid and then, uh, you know, things that cause low stomach acid. So if you haven't done so, go back and listen to part one and two. They're a little bit more sciencey, but a lot of good information in there relating to why it's important, what happens in the body, in the stomach, and this kind of digestive cascade that uh, is very important to absorb the foods that you consume. So symptoms, bloating, especially after you eat meals, heartburn, acid reflux, as we've talked at nauseam about so far, it is typically too little stomach acid. When you're experiencing heartburn, acid reflux, or GERD, nine out of 10 people, it's too low of stomach acid. It's actually not um, too much. Undigested food in your stool, gas, um, especially if your gas smells, constipation or diarrhea, IBS, bacterial or parasite infections, which I'm very excited. We're going to be doing a podcast on soon. Sounds gross to a lot of people, but it's important for you to understand. Uh, yeast overgrowth, SIBO, food intolerances, you guys, it is not a food issue. It's a function issue. Yes, there are some outliers here that people should probably generally avoid, such as gluten. But most of the time when we have clients coming in and they are, I'm on such limited, you know, food intake because I feel like I'm sensitive to everything. That's not normal. That's an indication of leaky gut. Um, then we look at bad breath. Uh, we look at also deficiency. So vitamin B12 deficiency, magnesium, calcium, iron, and zinc. So a lot of these Minerals and vitamins are absorbed with the support of hydrochloric acid, stomach acid, or they are needed to produce stomach acid. So it's, um, you know, a bit of a web here. Poor hair, uh, teeth and nails. So you have brittle hairs, you have ridges on your, uh, you have brittle hair, ridges on your nails, or you're losing your hair. That can be, you know, a sign of low stomach acid as well. High triglycerides and cholesterol, estrogen dominance and PMS because, Again, your hormones are impacted by your gut. Detoxification is impacted by your gut. And we know that reduced stomach acid or hydrochloric acid has been associated with all of these and more. This is not a comprehensive list, um, but it's very, very important if you are somebody who's struggling with a lot of symptoms that one, you get the right testing done, and two, this is part of your comprehensive plan. And so what, what causes low levels of stomach acid? Well, aging, high levels of stress, high sugar diets, poor protein intake. So stomach acid is created in the presence of protein. One of its big roles is to denature and break down protein. Low zinc status. So again, this is one of those minerals. Zinc is needed to create stomach acid. Stomach acid is needed to absorb zinc. Also plays a big role in your hair. Eating on the run. So you are not chewing your food well. You're eating in a stressed state. Digestion is not prioritized. You're putting large particles of food on your digestive system into the stomach and you're expecting the chemical reactions to break that food down into usable substances, yet we are lacking those chemical reactions or they're not functioning the way that they should. Proton pump inhibitors, acid blockers, histamine blockers, over-the-counter antacids, as well as prescription PPIs, all lower our stomach acid levels. Yep. So how do you know if this is you? How do you know, you know, I will admit when we were kind of putting together the symptoms, you look at like the symptoms list and it's like, 
all symptoms, all symptoms mm-hmm. indicate low stomach acid. <laughs> like there's, you know, it literally can drive so much. And so how can you know who's ready for an at-home DIY test? Um, so if you have one or more of the symptoms above, it can be very likely that your levels of HCL are suboptimal. Um, so the most accurate way to find out if you have low HCL is called the Heidelberg test or gastric acid function test, okay, which your GP can prescribe. However, it is more likely that they are not going to. These tend to be a little bit more nuanced tests. Um, they, I don't think they're very cheap to have done. Um, and so I, it's not something that like, you know, if you asked, go and ask your doctor to get you a primary, you know, uh, CMP or CBC panel, like an annual panel, this isn't the same thing. They're not just going to willingly give you, you know, a, a one of these tests. Um, your doctor is more likely to think that your indigestion and reflux is probably caused by excess acid, um, and they're probably not going to offer the test. But those are the most accurate ways because they actually test the pH level of the stomach. Um, but there is a simple at-home test that you can do for yourself. Again, this is not 100% accuracy, but it gives you a fair indication of your levels of stomach acid. First thing in the morning, on an empty stomach, you drink a glass of water with one-fourth teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda. You choose aluminum free if possible. Um, this baking soda dissolved in it. And then time up to five minutes. So set a timer after you drink this. Try not to like totally chug it, but drink it quick enough. And then if you burp within two to three minutes, you should indicate that you have enough stomach acid. If you burp straight away, you have too much. And beyond four minutes is too little. Okay, so if it's again, you burp right away, too much stomach acid, or you drink it too fast. Um, burp kind of in that middle ground, two to three minutes, you indicates you have enough. Beyond four minutes, not enough stomach acid. You guys, we've had lots of clients do this. We've seen no burping <laughs> at all. Um, we've seen upwards of like 15, 20 minutes. Um, so it is again very common. So how do we increase it? How do you how can you naturally increase stomach acid? There's a number of different ways, natural ways that you can improve HCL and upper digestive function if that's something you struggle with. Um, none of the following are suitable if you suffer from gastritis or ulcers. Okay. So please keep that in mind. Bitter herbs such as gentian, globe artichoke, hops, and dandelion root are some of the safest and most effective herbs at stimulating gastric acid. Ginger is also a great digestive stimulant. So dandelion root tea actually um, tastes kind of like coffee. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our clients that have to remove coffee for whatever reason, whether it's a sensitivity to it or they're reacting to it, Dandelion root tea actually can be a great introduction um, in place of that because it does taste like coffee. Um, So also increases stomach acid levels. Um, and they most they work most effectively in tincture form, so they're best obtained from a qualified practitioner. Um, tincture form is basically like a dropper, um, a liquid form. And the reason being typically for this is when you have low stomach acid or when you have digestive stress, you simply do not break down and absorb things as well. That includes supplements. And so a lot of times when we have clients come to us that are symptomatic, we run a GI map or we run some type of testing with them and it shows that their gut's a mess, their microbiome is completely insufficient. Like we're in a not a good place in terms of their gut. They're on 10 different supplements. They're probably absorbing none of them. So you're basically just pooping or peeing away your supplements because your digestive system is at such a you know, low place that it's not even able to use those supplements. So keep that in mind if you're trying to DIY your health with a bunch of supplements and you're dealing with a bunch of bloating, constipation, GI issues. Um, If you have only access to the dried herbs, you can make an infusion of pure dandelion root. Um, Check in the ingredients, obviously, if you buy this in granule form, they add sugar and dairy. Always check the ingredients, guys. Always, always. Um, One teaspoon per cup, and you can drink a half a cup warm 20 minutes before meals uh, to help with some of the stomach acid production. Um, Doing this stuff on an empty stomach can be very helpful. Uh, We'll mention in a second apple cider vinegar also. Very, very helpful. A lot of people tout apple cider vinegar as this like, you know, amazing weight loss thing. It's because it's tied to the gut, guys. It's because it's tied to the gut. Yeah. And I actually need to do a little bit more research on this too, because the glucose goddess talks a lot about doing uh, vinegar Mm. to, you know, lower the glucose response in the body. I was chatting with a client about it yesterday and I have not read the research articles that she references. So I'm curious about that as well. Like how does that work? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it works. And this is kind of just what I was, uh, you know, deducing and saying to, you know, one of my clients when we were talking about it and we actually talked about this in 
part two of this series, I think it's because of the way that, you know, it stimulates stomach acid, which in turn allows you to absorb and digest your carbohydrates instead of having them sit and ferment. And then there's carbohydrate malabsorption, right? And when carbohydrates do not get absorbed properly, they linger longer in your digestive system and bacteria can consume more calories from them. That's another little fun fact that I actually read a couple weeks ago. That is a big driver of, well, not a big driver, but a contributor to weight gain with poor mm-hmm. digestion because your body and the bacteria, the bad bacteria, are actually extracting more calories from your food. Mm-hmm. They, they thrive yeah. off of what we consume. And so we often see this with clients who are doing everything right. They're eating in a calorie deficit and they're not losing weight. It's because they have bacteria strands in their gut, maybe multiples uh, that are just thriving and living life. Uh, and you know, the host or the person is like, what the heck? I'm doing all these things and I'm not seeing change. Um, okay, so let's continue through. So apple cider vinegar or lemon water. So in our practice, one of the things that I have, you know, shared with some of our clients, if we have done a stomach acid tolerance test or we've done this, you know, baking soda test and they don't want to go on, you know, certain uh, supplements, then we can use apple cider vinegar or lemon naturally. So if you're using lemon, you can do that with a pinch of him pink Himalayan sea salt in the morning time. Some people say, you know, it's better if it's warm lemon water, um, up to you. you can do that first thing in the morning. And then you can also sip on apple cider vinegar with your meals. So a couple of notes here. Number one is apple cider vinegar and lemon are very acidic, obviously. Mm-hmm. So I like to sip them through a straw just because you don't want it to impact the enamel on your teeth. Cautious of that. Number two, I don't personally like the taste of uh, apple cider vinegar, so <laughs> I am more inclined to do the lemon, but you can absolutely do apple cider vinegar with your meals. And so you will do one to two teaspoons. I would also say, I was just raising my hand because I didn't want to completely interrupt you. Apple cider vinegar gummies are not the same. They have sugar. They have tapioca syrup in them. They're, you guys, I I get it. Like they taste better than apple cider vinegar, but you're adding sugar, which is a lot of the problem a lot of times with feeding the bad bacteria. So no, no to apple cider vinegar gummies. Or pills. Or pills. I would say. That's not not the same. Digesting and absorbing. You want the acidity, yes. right? We're trying to create an acidic environment to acidify your food, detoxify your food, right? Uh, so you can do one to two teaspoons of apple cider vinegar in a small glass of water. We want to keep your liquids with your meals low. Four to six ounces, I would say, is kind of the range because when you're consuming large amounts of liquid when you're eating, you're essentially diluting your gastric juices. So what are we all know from the diet uh, cult industry, right? Diet culture tells us, Oh, drink a bunch of water and drink a bunch of water with your meals. So you get full faster. I've heard that from so many clients and they're like, it makes so much sense what you're saying that, yeah, then we are diluting, you know, all of these juices that we need to break down our food. So four to six ounces, sip on it with your meals. Um, I would also say that you can, you know, incorporate zinc because this is necessary uh, to produce carbonic and hydrase and enzyme involved in gastric acid production. Again, as I mentioned before, you need zinc to to create hydrochloric acid, you need hydrochloric acid to absorb zinc. We like zinc picolinate. So that's one that you could add if you wanted to on your own. We like biotics uh, research. I think it's a very safe thing that you could supplement with. A lot of people have added zinc into their protocols just with COVID and everything. So zinc 15 or zinc 30 is typically uh, what I recommend. Mm -hmm. All right. Eat the protein first at the meal. Amino acids are extremely important for developing and stimulating gastric acid release. So eat the protein first. It also helps with blood sugar regulation. Eat in a peaceful, stress-free environment as much as you can. Enjoying tasty food, the smell, the anticipation, all of that triggers gastric acid release. Eating should be an experience. I'm not saying I'm perfect at this. I don't think anyone is perfect at this, but like you should not be scarfing your food down in the car in between kid drop off. You should not be, you know, in between meetings, running to the next meeting, taking bites of a sandwich. Like you need to make sure eating is a parasympathetic, eating and digesting. I'm sorry. Eating can obviously be done in any environment. Any, we can see that digestion is a parasympathetic function, meaning a relax, a rest and digest. Why do you think rest and digest is the basically catchphrase for parasympathetic nervous system function? Because you cannot digest food if you're stressed. You simply cannot. Hence, why stress and poor digestion often go hand in hand. When we have clients and come to us with symptoms, 
stress is the main driver of nearly all dysfunction. And so you need to try and make sure that is an easy, free tip to add in, be in a relaxed state. At least try. Like, take a big deep breath, or you can take a couple deep breaths for each bite, put the fork down. Also, fun fact, food stays in your esophagus for about four to six seconds before entering the stomach. And so if you're taking bites, like inhaling them like a werewolf, you're going to have too much food trying to enter the stomach at once, which basically makes a poor digestive situation. So eat slowly, guys. I know we skipped over um, the swapping the water for the mm-hmm. gelatin um, and bone, you know, mineral rich bone broth. Both can be very, very uh, soothing for the gut because they help stimulate digestive juices. The only thing I will say is if you have high histamine levels or you have a lot of allergy issues, um, I would be careful with bone broth because it is histamine inducing. So um, just word of advice. Same with apple cider vinegar. Mm-hmm. So that's why, you know, with some of our clients, if we're working with a lot of dysfunction, there are th- protocols that we use outside of this. And, yeah. you know, again, I've said this before, uh, I think on our podcast or maybe just on Instagram, I've had a lot of people asking, you know, questions about how do I naturally, you know, support my body to produce levels of stomach acid or get rid of heartburn and acid reflux and GERD. And so we're giving you everything we can give you within, uh, you know, the guidelines of your general population that's listening to this, you're not a client. When you're working with us individually as a client, we have eyes on a lot more things that we can give you targeted supplements and protocols. Even, you know, one person that has H. pylori compared to another person that has H. pylori and candida, their protocols are different, right? Because they have other things going on. Maybe the first person has a lot of uh, opportunistic bacteria, bad bugs overgrowing. You know, we reference these as like the weeds in your garden. You have a lot of weeds. You have um, not enough flowers. That's going to look very different compared to somebody else who also like has a parasite. So we just want to, you know, give you guys this information so that you can do better for yourself and support your body naturally. But when it comes to like supplemental protocols, and we'll talk about that here in a moment, uh, this is not advice for you to begin taking supplements. Um, so just be clear on that. If you do have, um, you know, gastric ulcers or you have gastritis or anything like that, this is not for you. You need to be working with a practitioner um, and be, you know, monitored through protocols for healing. Uh, other things that we can do here in terms of, you know, supporting your body to naturally produce stomach acid is to start your meals with some bitter leaves or incorporate these bitter leaves into, you know, your salad and such, um, dandelion leaves. You can do radishino, burdock root, artichoke leaf, wormwood, motherwort, chamomile, those types of things. I also would say arugula. Um, I use arugula a lot. I do arugula spinach or we do like a protein blend. I love those. Um, and then again, if you're not, you know, dealing with a histamine intolerance, you can add some of these fermented foods into your diet uh, and some, you know, acid into your meals in the form of that, um, you know, vinaigrette, apple cider vinegar, lemon, those types of things. I love doing, you know, kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, fermented vegetables are easy to make at home as well if you want to do that. So it's really up to you. And what I would say here is anything that is fermented should be incorporated in small doses. What I wouldn't want is somebody listening to this podcast and they go out and they order, you know, they've got kimchi, they've got kefir, they've got uh, kombucha. Yeah. You know, and you're just like going to town on these things that can lead to a lot of, you know, digestive Mm -hmm. upset. And so we don't uh, promote that, but try to incorporate these things and diversify your diet as much as you can to get as much nutrients in as well. Yeah, absolutely. That was when I was super stressed training a lot with CrossFit I used to have kombucha in the afternoon and I, by the nighttime I was so bloated and gassy and I was like, why am I so bloated and gassy? It took me forever because obviously at that time that was like, what, 10 years ago. Um, I had no idea. And now I know it's because my gut was not in a good place when I was super stressed all the time. Um, so if you re- kombucha fermented foods are very common reactors for people that have gut dysfunction. Um, so there are also some ways to supplement uh, for this. So Biotinine, um, betanine, wow. <laughs> Just making up words today, guys. Betanine, hydrochloride, and pepsin. Um, pepsin is a digestive enzyme that your body creates to help break down protein. So betanine and hydrochloride, betanine, hydrochloride, and pepsin are both things that can be taken. 
this is stuff that we do with our clients. This should be done with a qualified practitioner. Do not just start supplementing with things. Um, some people do not tolerate this very well. And when that's the case, it can be an indication of a gut bacterial infection um, called H. pylori. So we would want to eradicate that first and build up the stomach acid as this lives and thrives in the GI tract if the stomach acid is low. Um, so H. pylori is essentially an infection and it's called Helicobacter pylori. And it's a bacteria that can cause an infection in the stomach or duodenum, um, which is basically the first part of your small intestine. And it's the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease. Um, so H. pylori can cause inflammation. It can irritate the stomach lining, which is known as gastritis. And if untreated long term, H. pylori infection can actually lead to stomach cancer in rare, case, uh, rare circumstances. So H. pylori also is very, very prominent. Um, and you might say, like, super gross. I have an infection in my stomach. There's a lot of things that may surprise people about bacteria that live in your gut. Um, in fact, those with the lowest symptoms often have the most overgrowth and imbalances. It's crazy, guys. Mm -hmm. It is. Crazy. Well, and here's the thing. You have to think about how many things you're exposed to each and every day. We eat vegetables, right, and fruits, animal proteins, unless you're, you know, living a vegan diet. And even if you're living, you know, more vegan vegetarian, you're still then eating a lot more plants, beans, things that come from the earth. And, you know, all of these things have parasites, bacteria, fungi, all these types of bacteria sources or pathogen sources, I should say, that enter into the GI tract. And so we've talked about this at nauseum too. One of the biggest and most important roles of stomach acid is to protect you from these things, to kill those pathogens that enter into your system that don't belong there so that they can't set up camp. Because essentially, if you have low stomach acid, they survive they set up camp and you have to do, you know, eradication protocols to kill them off and get them out of the gut. So how prevalent is H. pylori? This is, again, only one. We could talk, you know, podcasts for 10 years about all kinds of different things that, you know, reside in the gut, but H. pylori is very common. It's present in about 50 to 75% of the world's population. Um, it doesn't cause illness in most people. So when we see an H. pylori infection come back on the tests that we run, there's a whole list of what's called virulence factors that tell us, you know, is this active? What's the risk? What type of uh, gene is this H. pylori? Um, we do see H. pylori in children as well. So about 5% of children under the the age of 10 have H. pylori and those with infection are most likely to incur in those that live in crowded conditions, areas with poor sanitation. And it is important to know that this can spread from person to person. So H. pylori is found in saliva, plaque on teeth and poop. So, you know, having little kids, it's a great time because you're exposed to all those things all the time. Um, and it can also be spread, you know, from person to person, obviously your spouse or your intimate uh, relationship partner uh, kissing and transferring the bacteria, um, you know, through your saliva and then also just hands, right? Um, if you've not washed your hands thoroughly after bowel movements or wiping your kids' bowel movements, um, all those types of things. But uh, there is some evidence too that H. pylori can also be spread through food and uh, contaminated water. So if you choose to do this on your own, uh, you've listened to this podcast, you're like, hey, maybe, you know, I want to do the baking soda test. Maybe I'm going to try to, you know, add some of these other things in and you decide I'm going to do the betanine and HCL, uh, you know, tolerance test here. Just know that that's at your own risk. Uh, you really should be doing this with a qualified practitioner. Um, if you are going to do it, our recommendation is that you titrate up slowly. We titrate up, we titrate down. Um, and the supplement is actually intended to increase your production of hydrochloric acid over time. We use it in our practice somewhere in the ballpark of eight to 12 weeks. So lastly, as we wrap up here, just in case you haven't heard us loud and clear, over-the-counter antacids and proton pump inhibitors are going to do the exact opposite of everything we just talked about. So if you're somebody who says, you know, I just have this breakthrough acid reflux, heartburn, and GERD, that's still a sign and a symptom that stomach acid levels are low, even if it's not chronic and it's not happening all the time. You know, of course, they think there are things that can impact this too. If you're eating a large, you know, meal and then you go and you lay down, okay, yeah, you're probably not going to feel so great, right? Because your body is still working through digesting this food. Um, and so as we talked about, go back and maybe listen to some of those things, incorporate these foods into your diet, focus on how you eat. This is so underestimated. I've said it on my Instagram. I don't know. I probably have three or four posts about it already. How you eat and the importance of chewing your food is something that I think everybody can 
work on. I know I can work on it. Mm -hmm. Um, I am not perfect with this, but I try to do my best even on busy days to take five to 10 deep breaths, signaling my central nervous system into that rest and digest state, more of the parasympathetic that I'm chewing my food, set your fork down, you know, between bites, really taste and savor that food, chew your dang food. This is the number one thing that I would say, if you're not doing that, all the protocols, all the supplements, all the other foods that you're going to add in, they're basically not going to be beneficial if you are working against yourself because you're not eating properly. Yeah. Like literally the next meal you have, count how many times you chew before you swallow. It should be at least 10. I, a lot of people say 15 to 20. The food should be like mm-hmm. applesauce before you swallow it. Mm-hmm. Everything that I've read recently says 20 to 30. Mm-hmm. I think it depends upon what you're eating, right? Yes. If you're eating a steak, Actually, last night we were eating steak and I had taken a, a bite that was too big and I spit it out and I cut it in half because I was like, whoa, okay, because I'm guilty of this. Like, oh, especially if your food is yummy, you're mm-hmm. like, oh, this is so good. I want to eat so much. I blame my dad. Mm-hmm. We were, I was a fast eater growing up. My dad is a very fast eater. Like, my dad's one of those people that would sit down at the dinner table before everyone else was ready to sit down and eat his food when no one else was there and then be done before everyone else got started. <laughs> my dad was the exact opposite. He literally, uh. to this day, And now he doesn't have teeth, um, so it makes it harder, obviously. (laughs) But to this day, sits and he will, he will eat his food for an hour, hour and a half if you let him. Like so, yeah. All right, Uh, that's all we got for you guys. We hope that this was helpful. If you are somebody who's struggling with a lot of these symptoms and you want to get to the root cause issue of what is going on, don't hesitate to reach out. We have our gut group going on that starts on the fifteenth, so that includes your GI map test. Uh, all the links will be in the show notes, and it's a three month program that we're running uh, to help you work through some of these things, identify the root cause, and not only do that, but actually have a plan in place for you as an individual, so that you can work towards healing and optimizing your health. Thank you for listening to The Food Code. If this episode resonated with you, please share, rate, and review as this helps us reach others around the world. With that, thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. Love you guys.